Hmm. I've I just been reading this book, The Visionary Landscape. It's talking about an extraordinary complex pattern of uh, sacred sites in London and surrounding London. And to me it's interesting. I mean, on the one hand, it's, it's interesting esoteric knowledge. You know, I was born in London like that, so... And I, I do have a strong sense of the mystical traditions in England, like so, uh, Stonehenge is obviously a place of deep mystery. So many people are really uh, fascinated by Stonehenge, the meaning, significance of Stonehenge, and the Arthurian legend. I was, you know, as a young, as a youngster, I was really fascinated by King Arthur. I read King Arthur legends, and it seems to me they're unique. So there's something very mystical and, and, and wonderful about about Britain, Druids. But what's that got to do with you know the Vedic tradition? Why should I now, as a practitioner of Krishna consciousness, bhakti yoga, be interested in this stuff? You know, esoterica. What's what's the what's the relevance? Well, it is relevant because. I'm particularly interested in sharing with people in general Vedic knowledge, the relevance of Vedic knowledge. And there's a very deep connection, actually. One thing is that there's, you know, study of uh, sacred geometry. So if we look at the, the relationships in the Earth, the Moon, and the Sun, it's obvious that the moon is a really remarkable celestial body because it's going round and pretty close to a circle around the, around the Earth. It's exactly the same size, or, you know, as the sun, proportionately. And it's always got its face towards the Earth, so you get these, you get eclipses. That's extraordinary. It's an extraordinary coincidence. When you look into the numerical relationships, you begin to see that in miles, measured in miles, the size of the moon, the size of the earth, the size of the sun, the relationships between them, they all start, they come up in very beautiful numbers. Multiples, for example, of 36. Which itself is a, a, is a significant number. It's naught to the power of naught times one to the power of one times two to the power of two times three to the power of three. It's three. It's a, it's a very symmetrical, beautiful number. So you begin to see that there's a design in the proportions and the relationships between the Earth, Sun, and Moon. Now we're getting into something extraordinary, because, you know, obviously I, I, I do want to have a sense myself and share with other people that there's design in the universe. It's not just a haphazard collection of chunks that came together by some blind forces. But then we go further, and like this, for example, shows that the proportions of the Earth, Sun, and Moon, they're actually in the landscape around London. The proportions, uh, there's two circles specifically of sacred places, and they're in the proportion of the Earth to the Earth plus the Moon, diameters of the Earth plus the Earth plus the Moon. That's really extraordinary. So if these, these sacred places they were known to the ancients, so it means that the ancient people, the so-called so barbarian savages that the Romans tamed and the Christians despised, they actually had a very, very high culture. Now, it, it turns out that this uh, very exact knowledge of the proportions of the Earth, the Moon, and the Sun, which is only just recently, within, say, the last hundred years, known to so-called civilized Western people, was well known to the ancients and was built into the landscape. And you can see this in Stonehenge, not only in Stonehenge, but there are other sacred sites like around London, and, and it becomes obvious that the megalithic stone culture, which is like 5,000, 6,000, 7,000 years ago, all this is well known, and they had surveying techniques, they could understand, they knew the size of the moon, the earth, and it was built into their system of measurements. The, the foot, the yard, 
the furlong, the rod polar perch, the mile, all of these numbers all come up in this. And it's also, uh, like it's described in, in, in this book here by uh, Street, what's Chris his Street, name? Yeah, Chris Earth Street, Stars, yeah. Chris Street. That it's also, this knowledge is also encoded into the descriptions of, of Jerusalem. So we're looking at a very, very ancient, extremely advanced uh, numer uh, science of numbers, of astronomy, of surveying, um, the ability to manhandle colossal stone objects over like Stonehenge, the, the stones are brought some, I think, 250 miles? Or half a About 150 miles from okay. Priscilla to, to Stonehenge, yeah. And, fi you know, some of the biggest stones were 50 tons each. Uh, I mean, you know, to a group of modern people without, even with cranes, it'd be a great, it'd be a challenge. So how they did it then. So in other words, what, what we come up with is an extremely advanced ancient culture. And they took the trouble probably is their own worship, but also it's preserved for us so that as we come to a level where we can appreciate their expertise, they're pointing out to us not just their own superiority, cultural superiority, but also the, the beautiful proportions and design in the universe itself. That to me is staggering. It's really staggering. And I would like to go into this and I'd like to share it with others. Uh, to share this sense of wonder and to understand also, okay, they knew about the numbers, they knew about the proportion, what else did they know? And the Vedic wisdom has got some very, very important truths to give us, like uh, the existence of the soul as the animating force, the life force in the body, not just my body, but in the body of the trees, the birds, the fish, everything. The divine intelligence that's organizing this universe, not just moving chunks around and arranging them at nice distances from each other, but arranging the whole of society, arranging the whole ecological network of the earth so that everyone can be in harmony and be very happy and comfortable materially and progress spiritually. That wisdom, how material nature works, like the three there's three basic processes in nature creation, destruction and maintenance so those correspond to three modes of material nature how that affects us how it affects events in the material world how we can order society arrange society so that everybody works together according to their work talents according to the ideals and values born of their innate natures and ultimately according to their, the, the real nature of the soul, the relationship of the soul, everything, all of that is built into the Vedic, the Vedic culture. And this is the original culture of the human race, and it's different groups have tried to obliterate it. Different cultural groups, political groups, religious groups, you know, blank out the pagans. But this pagan, it's, uh, you know, it's become, it's come like a very pejorative word. Like wicked, for example. Wicked means, wicca, means the ancient knowledge. So it's time to reinstate this very beautiful, very significant, very important, very essential ancient knowledge and begin to live it once more. Probably in small communities at first, but this, this is actually the way forward. This is the, the way of the future. So with these stone circles, we can see they've been quite well preserved in England and in some places in Europe, but it, it's it's come to light in the last few decades that these stone circles, same things, dolmens, menhirs, uh, huge megaliths, they've also been found in Australia, the Americas, India, in India, Russia. Russia, all over the planet basically, and with consistent dimensions, proportions, units of measurement across the planet in countries that we're told had no communication until very recently right. but these these megalithic uh, structures were built yeah you know, around uh, from what I can understand about five four five six thousand years ago um, 
And, of course, the Vedic version of history is that there was a, a global culture then. And, and from my recent understanding, that the culture that we refer to as Celtic culture um, and the Druids, that it, it's very clear now from the, the parallels that have, that have been brought out that the Celtic culture was actually Vedic culture and that the Druids were actually the same as the Brahmins or, or, the, or the Sannyasis. Sannyasis. So, could you so say I'm like a Druid. Yeah, so when my, my friend uh, and godbrother um, he, he like explained this that the original, the original culture in Britain was pure Vedic there was, there was no difference and the Druids they weren't monsters who were you know, burning people in wicked cages and like that that's something that's been superimposed by uh, who did it but actually they were very very austere very they were beautiful sacred personalities and they were preserving a very, very rich material and spiritual culture. And their, their stages of initiation, stages of renunciation, stages, uh, stages of accumulating this knowledge, they correspond to the Vedic culture. So in Srimad Bhagavatam, for example, it's described that up until, say, 5,000 years ago, there was a worldwide empire. The king... The Vedic culture was centered in India, which is where there's so many recorded incarnations of the Supreme Lord who have appeared in India, much more than in other places in the world. And those kings, they were actually king of the whole world. So when we see these connections between, for example, the Vedic culture, the Aztec culture, the Mayan culture, and Aboriginal Australian culture, and all in, you know, in, in Asia... So it confirms the fact that there was originally a, a, a civilization, a worldwide civilization, embodying very wonderful secrets, very wonderful knowledge, which enabled people to live to actually to a degree of wealth, abundance, prosperity that we can't even dream of now. I mean, India, for example, you know, it's, it's poor, supposedly a poor country now, but before the, the Muslims and the, and the British pillaged India, it was the most fabulously wealthy country in the world. I mean, we couldn't dream of it. We couldn't dream of the riches in India. And that came because people were living in harmony with the natural laws. And especially society was set up, you had the kings. The kings were, they were sacred kings. But they weren't just despots, because they, they, they governed under the direction of the brahmanas like the Druids. And the Druids were very renounced. Very renounced. Or the, the, the Brahmanas, they were very renounced. So you couldn't bribe them in those days. And they would direct the king. So you had a very, very good combination. The king was powerful, he was opulent, uh, and he, he ruled under the direction of the, the Brahmanas, the sacred priests. And then when the king came to, say, age 50, his son was already at an age to come to the throne, the king would just enthrone the sun, he'd go off, and go, go off to the forest and practice austerities. That was expected. It wasn't expected that they would hang on to their positions until their last tottering days. And how far back in history does this system go? The, the Kurukshetra, the, the Vedic period, like the cycles, now we're now in what's called Kali Yuga, which, go, which lasts for 4,000... 432,000 years. And the age before that, that's the, the Iron Age. And the age before that was known as the Copper Age, or uh, Dwarpa Yuga. Bronze Age. Bronze Age, couldn't say, yeah. So that ended about 5,000 years ago. It can, be, it can be dated quite accurately by astronomical calculations based on the descriptions in the Mahabharata. Mahabharata is the largest book in, in human culture. It's 800,000 four-line verses. It includes the Bhagavad Gita. So it describes eclipses, the positions of the planets, and it, it's, I, I don't remember the exact date, I think it's uh, 3, 000, something like 3027 BC, something like that. It was actually the time of the Kurukshetra War. 
and soon our, Krishna, Krishna himself, the Supreme Personality, appeared and took part in that war, and he continued to remain on the planet for a, a certain number of years after that, and then left. And at that point, Dwapa Yuga, that age, the Bronze Age, Copper Age, came to an end. And then the Iron Age started. So we know that Stonehenge, for example, example dates back, what, four, five, six thousand years. Mm -hmm. And the, meth megalithic, uh, the megalithic structures in Wales, for example, they go back another thousand or two thousand years beyond that. So we're looking at a very ancient culture, very ancient culture, which is already into the Vedic times which is beyond the beginning of modern recorded history I don't know when the you know like the Babylonians or the Chaldeans came but this the Vedic these structures predate uh, modern history I believe it was about 4000 BC that the, the Babylonian culture just appeared to have just arrived just sprang up out of nowhere right so that suggests that there wasn't a gradual evolution, it was given. Like the, like the Egyptian culture, it just seemed to <coughs> appear complete. There, there doesn't seem to be evidence of it, it evolving to its, its high state. Well, in the, in the Vedic tradition, it stated that the Egyptians, they were actually kshatriyas, means they were kings, who fled from India. And so they were bringing with them an already developed culture. The, the Egyptian... And, and people are more and more, they're coming to understand that, you know, where previously it was thought that the Greeks were the origin of European culture, actually the debt that the Greeks had to the Indian culture is now being appreciated. So is it just simply the effect of time that caused this, this obviously superior ideal system? Was it just the effect of time that caused it to, to come to an end? Time has a degrading influence.